Much of what we do in our everyday life is influenced by what we believe. And, and this truth can be applied to both uh, superficial matters and Im important matters. Uh, for instance, this morning when I got in my truck to uh, leave to come here to church, um, I got in the truck and I put the key in the ignition and I turned the ignition trusting that that truck was going to start. Uh, in other words, uh, before I got in the truck, I didn't go find the jumper cables or I didn't make sure that the air compressor was uh, nearby in case I had a flat tire. I, I was confident, I believed that by turning the key, my truck was going to start. Also, along those same lines, we could say that uh, this morning I left without grabbing an umbrella because I believed the weather report, and the weather report said we were not going to get rain today, so I wouldn't need the umbrella. So you see, just those are just some superficial uh, kinds of examples, but they're given to you just to simply say that much of what we do in our life is dictated by what we believe. And it can be as superficial as taking an umbrella or trusting our car to start. But when we apply faith or trust to serious matters, it begins to look very different. This morning's sermon is titled, A Faith That Saves, and it's based upon Romans, the third chapter, starting at verse 21, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 4, verse 3. So if you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open to that passage of Scripture. And if you're continuing to follow the Sunday School material, this is the passage of Scripture uh, you're studying here in your Sunday School lesson. Now we've been here in the book of Romans for a little while here now, and we've uh, said from the very beginning that Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, is doing some basic things at the very beginning. He's introducing himself. He's also beginning to lay out the things that he believes. But very quickly, Paul gets to the point where he is presenting to the church in Rome a very important doctrinal truth, and that is that we all need a Savior. He's already dealt with Gentiles and shown how they need a Savior, how they have worshipped what was created instead of the Creator. And then he turned to the Jews and began to speak to the Jewish population, making it clear that even Jews need a Savior. Now what we're going to discover here in the text here today is Paul helping us see how a holy God can have a right relationship with sinners like us who need a Savior. Now there's a lot of moving parts to that, but we're going to focus on one very simple part uh, that's necessary, that's a requirement, that, that has to be in place if salvation is ever going to take place at all. And that ingredient, that part that we're going to talk about here this morning is faith. You've got your Bibles open to that passage of Scripture by now, I hope. And just scan through there with me and see how often the word faith shows up in these verses. If uh, you'll let me, I'll, I'll guide you through that. Verse 22, the word faith appears there in that verse. It also appears in verse 25 and 26 and 27 and 28 and verse 30 and verse 31 and chapter 4 verse 3. Faith or a variation of that word shows up in all of those verses. Now I don't know about you, but it seems pretty clear to me that Paul's trying to tell us something about faith. And what he's trying to say to us is that it is a requirement in order for us sinful people to have a right relationship with God. But now here's the $64,000 question. Paul is saying faith is required, yes, but here's the real question. What is it that we must believe? Can we just believe anything about Jesus? Well, obviously no. We have to believe the right things about Jesus Christ. That's what we mean by a faith that saves. Let me make sure I'm saying this as plainly as I can. Islam cannot save you. Allah cannot save you. Confucius can't save you. Astrology, looking at the stars, that can't save you. Many of you are concerned about the coronavirus and hopefully there's a vaccine coming. And if you get it, that's great, but that vaccine is not going to save you. Money can't save you. Being a good person can't save you. Being politically correct cannot save you. The only thing that can save you is a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. And here in this passage of Scripture, Paul shows very clearly how it is that we must have a saving faith, a faith that matters in order 
to be saved. It's not just believing anything that we want to. There are some very specific things about faith that are necessary for it to be a saving faith. And Paul helps us to see what that looks like. And what I'm asking you to do here this morning is to allow this passage of Scripture to confront you, to put your faith under a microscope. Let's let this passage of Scripture speak to us and see if we in fact do have a saving faith. You know, the real question, not only for us here this morning, but for our world, is this. Have we succumbed to an easy believism when it comes to God and Jesus Christ, or do we have a faith that matters, a faith that truly saves? Well, we're going to go to this passage of Scripture here now. And we're going to allow this passage of Scripture to show us what a true saving faith looks like. So let's look at these verses here together now. We're in chapter 3. Let's look at verses 21 through 23 here together. It says this, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now you heard right there in those verses something we've already affirmed. Salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. But you know, in those verses, Paul also said something else important about us. And that's the first thing that we've got to believe if we're going to have a saving faith. And here it is. We must believe the truth about ourselves. And those verses there tell us something important about ourselves. Now, all along, Paul has been making a case here that we need a Savior. And here in this section, he's still dealing with the Jewish population. And their hope rested in the fact that they were Jews and that they had the law, and through the law, that was going to be what allowed them to be a part of God's family. But all along, Paul has been making it very clear that the law cannot save. And he does it again here in this verse, verse 21. Look at it with me. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. He shows right there that this righteousness of God has nothing to do with the law. Now, when we see that phrase, righteousness of God, Paul's not saying, now we suddenly understand now that God is righteous. He's not saying that. He's saying the way a sinful person can be right with God has now been revealed to us. And the obvious revelation of that is in Jesus Christ. But the point there is that it is apart from the law. We are acceptable not because of the law, but because of faith. Now, this being apart from the law not only predicates our faith and helps us to understand how important that faith is, but it's also available to those who believe. Look at what it says there. It says, the righteousness of God is through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. Now, folks, there's a reason why it's available to all who believe. And it's because of what verse 23 says. It's available to all who believe because verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the truth about us. We're sinners. That's what the Bible tells us. And for us to have a faith that saves, we've got to begin here. We've got to begin and acknowledge that we are sinners. I heard an old story of a, a preacher who was preaching a revival in a neighboring church, not his own church, another church. And he was, he was up there preaching that evening, and he was sweating and taking his jacket off. I mean, he was really getting into his sermon, and, and he was one of those fire and brimstone kind of preachers. And, and at one point in his sermon, he was preaching about sin, and he said this. He said, every member of this church is a sinner and deserves to go to hell. And when he made that statement, there was a man on the back pew back there who started smiling just real big. And the, the, the preacher saw that, and so he was a little bit concerned. So he wanted to make sure this guy got the message. So he said it again. He says, I'm telling you, every member of this church deserves to go to hell and is a sinner. And that guy on the back pew just smiled even more broadly. So the, the preacher was concerned about this guy, so he just kind of stopped in mid-sermon and said, Mr., you on the back row there... You've heard me say it twice that every member of this church is a sinner and deserves to go to hell, and you've been smiling about that. What's the deal? Haven't you heard what I've said? 
And the man on the back pew said, oh yes, I heard exactly what you said. The pastor said, well, well why are you smiling? And the man said, because I'm not a member of this church. Well, you know, there are a lot of people in our world that kind of approach this truth about us in the same way. They're looking for some kind of excuse. They're looking for some kind of way to exclude themselves from what the Bible says about us. But church, you just can't do that. You can't, just can't make up your mind that this isn't true. The Bible is telling us the truth. From the very moment every person on the planet chooses to do what's wrong instead of doing what's right, they become a sinner. And when they become a sinner, that puts them in a state in which they are unacceptable to God. And what compounds that is that we can't do anything to change our status. But Jesus can. We believe then, if we have a saving faith, that not only are we sinners in need of a Savior, but we also believe that Jesus has the power and the desire to exchange His righteousness for our sin. And that all begins when we first accept the truth about ourselves. Now, let's make sure we understand why we're talking about this. We're talking about having a faith that's real, a faith that saves. Why is it important to acknowledge that we're sinners? Well, look, if, if you can't acknowledge that you're a sinner, if you can't admit that, then guess what? You're also saying you don't need a Savior. So this is where we have to begin. We have to begin by saying, I understand and believe the truth about myself. I am a sinner in need of saving. And we believe that Jesus Christ has the power to do it. Well, now let's move to verses 24 through 26 and see another aspect of a faith that saves. Verse 24 it says, they are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as an atoning sacrifice in His blood, received through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented Him to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Now here we see another aspect of a faith that saves. We can't just believe anything or everything about Jesus. We've got to believe the important things and the right things. And here's another aspect of a faith that saves. We must believe the truth about grace. Now we've already established that we're all sinners in need of a, save, in, in need of a Savior. But if we, according to Scripture here, place our faith in Jesus, then what it said there in verse 24 is great news. It says, we are justified freely, now get this, by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul in the letter, his letter to the church in Ephesus said the same thing in a little bit different way. He said, for you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. And most of you know that that word gift there is the Greek word that's also used for grace. So it's built upon a proper understanding of grace. Paul said it very plainly. We're justified freely, how? By His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Let's reacquaint ourselves or maybe even learn some things about grace here for a few moments. Let's begin there at verse 24, at the very end of it, because it says that, again, we're justified freely by His grace, now get this, through the redemption that is found in Christ Jesus. What is it saying about Jesus? It's saying that He can redeem us. Now a person who can do that, that person must be a redeemer, and that's who Jesus is. The Bible even speaks about Him in those kinds of ways, saying that He is a redeemer. That's who He is, that's what He does. Now most of us understand this concept of redemption and redeeming, but just to make sure that you've got it, it means this, when a person redeems something, they pay a price that either sets it free or gives them control over that thing that they have paid for. So when we redeem someone who is in slavery, we are paying a price so that they can be set free. And many times redemption is understood in that kind of a context, setting a person free. 
And that, that understanding is applied very much to the gospel here because the Bible makes it plain that when we encounter sin and sin becomes a part of our lives, we're enslaved to sin. And so Jesus here is being portrayed as a redeemer who can pay the price to set us free from the slavery we're in because of sin. Now, a redeemer is not obligated to do that. A redeemer redeems not for his or her own benefit, but for the sake of the individual who is enslaved. Now, we've learned something important here about grace. And here it is. Grace is action that benefits someone else. And we see that plainly here when we talk about the gospel. Now, what have we heard? What have we learned? We're sinners in need of saving. Jesus has the power to redeem us. He has the power to pay a price that sets us free. But how does He do that? Well, let's look at verse 25. Verse 25 says, God presented Him as an atoning sacrifice in His blood. What was it that paid the price for our sin? It was Jesus going to the cross. That's what it was. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. And if someone doesn't intervene on our behalf, not only will we die physically, but we'll die spiritually because of our sin. But Jesus, because of His willingness to go to the cross, became an atoning sacrifice. He died in our place. He paid the wage that sin demands, death. And in so doing, He enacted grace. Now, notice very carefully that the Bible calls His death on the cross an atoning sacrifice. That word atoning or atonement, it means to make up for. It means to correct an error. It means to make up the deficit. So make no mistake, the Bible is making it plain. We as sinners can't do anything to help ourselves. It took an act of grace on God's behalf to go to the cross and die for us. And through that death, He atones for us. He makes up the difference. He makes up the deficit that is produced in us by sin so that we can have a right relationship with Him. Now that tells us something else important about grace. Don't miss this. One aspect of grace is the truth that the cross is sufficient. In other words, what Jesus did on the cross was enough to save you and to save me. We don't have to add anything to that. We don't have to add our good behavior. We don't have to add rituals. We don't have to add any kind of uh, added theology or philosophy. What Jesus did on the cross is sufficient. And we have to believe that what He did on the cross was sufficient. That my salvation is rooted in the hard, difficult work that He did for me, on my behalf, an act of grace. Now finally, as we look at verse 26 here, we, we understand another part of grace being given to us here in this verse. Grace really isn't grace if God is not righteous. But what does it say in verse 26? God presented Him, that's Jesus, to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so that He would be righteous. You know, what is being communicated here to us is this. God is a righteous God. God, even though He has made a way for us to have our sins dealt with, that has not changed His quality, His character, His attributes. God is still righteous. God still hates sin. God will always oppose sin. God will always do the right thing. But in His grace, in His recognition of our pitiful situation because of what sin has done to us, God, still being a righteous God, made a way for you and I to be saved. Not by asking us to take responsibility for our sin, but by taking responsibility for our sin Himself. The Bible says plainly in another section that Jesus became sin for us. You see, we can't begin to understand the scope of grace until we understand it's coming from a righteous God who hates sin and yet was willing to become sin for us so that we could be saved. Let me say it as plainly as I can. For a righteous God to love a sinner like me, it takes grace. And we've got to believe the truth about grace if we're going to have a faith that saves. You see, 
and this is the upshot of the whole section here, if, if we don't believe the truth about grace, then we're forever going to be trying to make up the deficits in us on our own. We're, we're forever going to be trying to do things that's going to make God proud of us or make sure He doesn't get mad at us. Look, what Jesus did on the cross was sufficient. What He did for us paid the price. And when we place our faith in Him, we have a right relationship with Him. Now, how can we have that kind of assurance? Well, that's the next part of a saving faith we're going to deal with. So let's look now at, again, we're going to read verse 26 and go all the way to chapter 4, verse 3. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous, now listen to this, and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No, on the contrary, by a law of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. What then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. A saving faith also includes this important truth. We must believe God is faithful. Now, if we go back to verse 26 and look at that verse, and then we go fast forward to chapter 4, verse 3, both of those verses tell us what God will do when we place a saving faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. What will He do? He will declare us righteous. That's what God will do. Have you ever heard somebody say, man, that sounds too good to be true? You ever heard that? Maybe you've even said that. And maybe you've even heard someone say, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't true. And we understand in our day and time that there's a lot of marketing that goes on that, well, we're not sure if it's true or not. It's just designed to get us to do something. But I'm here to tell you, church, what you're hearing right here tonight, or this morning, what you're hearing is an offer that is true, a remarkable offer in which God Himself is saying, by the mere fact of you placing your faith in Jesus Christ and making Him Lord of your life, I am going to do a supernatural act. I am going to tra take your sin and forgive it and trade it in and give you righteousness. God has done all the hard work. God has done what is necessary for you and I to be saved. Our contribution is to respond in a saving faith. And when we do that, a supernatural transaction takes place. Our sins are forgiven. And God sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ as a righteous person. Abraham is a good example of this. Paul, in his wisdom, uses Abraham here, and he does so for this reason. Abraham lived before the law was ever given. You know, Abraham was on the earth way before uh, the Hebrew people were there in Egypt, way before uh, Moses showed up and led them out uh, of captivity. Uh, Abram lived many years before that, and God went to him, and, and God established a covenant relationship with Abram, and, and He spoke to Abram about it many times. But we see here in chapter 4, verse 3, Paul using the very Scripture back in Genesis to support this case that it's faith that makes us righteous before God. Look again at verse 3. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. This comes from Genesis, the 15th chapter. And I want to read verses 5 and 6 just to make sure we get this uh, all together in our minds, what's really happening here. So if we go back to Genesis 15, verse 5, this is God speaking to Abram, and he, he does, it says this, He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then God said to Abram, Your offspring will be that numerous. And then here it is, the verse that Paul quotes, Abram believed the Lord, 
and he credited it to him as righteousness. You know, God had said to Abram, Abram, I want you to leave your land where you've grown up and go to a place far away, and I'll tell you when you get there, when you've arrived at the right spot. And then later he says to Abram, Abram, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and your descendants are going to be more numerous than the stars in the sky. Your descendants are going to be more numerous than the grains of sand on the seashore. I'm going to make you into a great nation. You're going to be blessed, and you're going to bless other nations because of this covenant relationship you have with me. And the only thing that Abram did was believe what God told him. And when he did that, the Bible says it was credited to him for righteousness. Abram's, so, Abram's status before God was dictated solely by his willingness to believe that God would do what he says he will do. AT&T just recently has been advertising their 5G service and, and uh, they've rolled out a campaign called Just Okay is Not Okay. Maybe you've seen so, some of those commercials on TV. You know, the whole idea behind the campaign is they're saying that some of their competitors have 5G, but it's just okay. But you know what? You don't want just okay. You want something better than just okay. And so they've created a number of commercials that say just okay is not okay. And we can think of all kinds of situations where something that's just okay is not okay. But in their commercials, one of them shows a, a, uh, an instructor, a, a skydiving instructor, and he and his pupil are up in the plane and they're getting ready to jump out. And his student says to the instructor, he says, man, I'm scared. And, and the instructor says to him, hey, don't be scared. I'm okay at this kind of thing. Well, look, if we're getting ready to jump out of an airplane strapped to some guy, we want him to be better at this than just okay, right? Another scenario, another commercial is a, a young lady who, who is getting her taxes done and the, the, the tax preparer is kind of a sketchy kind of individual. And he tells her, he says, don't worry, I'm going to get your taxes in an okay place. Just okay? Look, we don't want our taxes to just be okay or in an okay place. We want them to be right. We don't want to get in trouble. And they use that whole thing to say their service is not going to be just okay. It's going to be reliable, that we can count on them. That's the whole purpose of the campaign. Well, church, you know, sometimes people have this attitude about God and what He says and His reliability, kind of like that commercial campaign. You know, sometimes people think that God is just okay when it comes to reliability. But I'm here to tell you that I know from my own personal experience and from what the Bible says that God, when it comes to reliability, is not just okay. God is reliable. And listen, He's not just 90% of the time reliable. He's more than 95% reliable. Jesus is not just 99.99999% reliable. Jesus is 100% reliable. We can rely upon Him. He will do what He says He will do. And here in this passage of Scripture, it makes it very plain. When we place a saving faith in Jesus Christ, God says, I will declare you righteous. God will do what He says He will do. You see, our salvation is not built upon our feelings. Yes, when we got saved, maybe there was a lot of emotion, maybe relief, or we were just overwhelmed or happy or whatever. But I know from personal experience, and many of you do as well, that those feelings soon will go away. Does that mean that we're not saved anymore because we don't feel saved? Absolutely not. Why do we have the assurance that our salvation hasn't ended? Because of what God says. Because God is reliable. Because it's God who declares us as righteous. Our salvation isn't based upon feelings. Our salvation isn't based upon performance. We are fooling ourselves if we think that we can do enough good things that will keep us and make us acceptable before God to be in His family. No, our salvation is not built upon our performance, and we're glad that it isn't because we would all fail. It's not built upon feelings because they will go away. It's built upon what God says He will do. And God says, I will declare you righteous when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. God will do what He says He will do. And that's a part of a faith that truly saves. Let's make sure we get this. 
You see, if, if, we're, if we're saying we believe in God and we've got a faith that saves, but we don't trust that God's reliable, we don't trust that God will always do what He says He will do, this faith is a sham. It's just wishful thinking. We really have no hope. But that's not true. Our faith is not built upon a God who is only 90% reliable. Our faith and hope rest in a God who is 100% reliable. And because of that, we can have the assurance that what God says He will do, He will do. Well, it's an old story. I've even told it before here in this pulpit, but I can't think of a better story that illustrates what we're talking about. A long time ago, the year was 1859, that's been a long time, a Frenchman, a French acrobat who went by the name Blondine, he decided that he was going to stretch a cable across Niagara Falls and then walk that tightrope. Word got around that that's what he was going to do, and you can imagine crowds gathered at both ends of that cable to watch this man walk a tightrope over top of Niagara Falls without any kind of safety net, without any kind of security. And the day came for him to do it, and Blondine got up there, and he walked across that tightrope, that cable, made it from one side to the other, and then he turned around and he walked back the other way. And this fellow Blondine, he didn't do it just one time. I mean, he made a real spectacle out of this. He did numerous things while he was walking that tightrope. He read a book one time. He ate an omelet one time. He carried a person one time all the way over and back. And there was one time in particular when he took a wheelbarrow and he pushed a wheelbarrow in front of him all the way across as he was walking that tightrope over top of Niagara Falls. When he got to the other side with the wheelbarrow, he, he said to the crowd, do you think I can do it again? And they all cheered and said, yes, we know you can do it again. You've been walking that tightrope many, many times here now. We know you can do it again. And Blondine said to the crowd, all right, I need a volunteer. Who will get in the wheelbarrow now? And you can imagine there was a very different response. There weren't too many who took him up on the offer to get in the wheelbarrow. Oh, yes, they believed that he could do it again, but... They weren't willing to risk their life to show it. I tell that story to simply illustrate the fact that there is a difference when it comes to faith. There's a difference between an easy believism that just makes us feel good about ourselves as opposed to a faith that truly saves, that takes serious not only our condition, but what God has done for us in order to save us. I need to ask you a question here this morning. Do you have a saving faith? Now let's make sure we understand what you're being asked. In other words, in your relationship with God, did you come to that place where you were willing to admit and agree the truth about yourself, that you're a sinner in need of saving? Do you have that kind of faith in which you understand your need for a Savior? And is your faith also the kind of faith in which you understand and accept the truth about grace. You know that you're a part of God's family, not because of your performance, not because God likes you, not because you've done all these wonderful things. You're a part of God's family solely because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and through His grace has offered it to you, a sinner. Is your saving faith of the type in which you realize that your faith and your continued walk with God rests on the truth that God is reliable, that God never changes, that God is always with us, that God will do what He says He will do. You see, my fear is, is that there are many people in our churches today who believe that they have a right relationship with God, but it's really just a very superficial kind of faith in which they think of God as the man upstairs or their co-pilot or just maybe even a tool in their toolbox that they pull out when they get in trouble. No, the Bible says that a relationship with God is predicated on a faith that saves. A faith that admits, I'm a sinner in need of sinning. 
A faith that admits that I am a part of God's family only because of the grace of God. A faith that admits that God is reliable and I can trust Him and I'm going to be obedient to Him and serve Him. Do you have that kind of saving faith? Listen, if you don't, the truth of the matter is, is that you can make a decision right now to begin a relationship with God through Jesus Christ by placing your faith in Him. It begins by confessing of our sin, telling the Lord that we are a sinner and we're in need of saving. It's a confession that you know that this offer is not because you're a good person. This offer of salvation is rest, resting upon the work of the cross and the grace that God is administering to you right now. It's, it's an offer that is also built on the reliability of God and His Word. And you can begin that right now by placing that kind of faith in Him. Do you need to do that? We want to encourage you to do that if God is speaking to your heart. Maybe there's another decision that God has put upon your heart here this morning. Maybe as a believer you've come to realize that you've allowed some things to get in between you and God. You stopped believing that God is reliable. You stopped counting on the grace of God in the midst of the difficult life that you're living. You've allowed yourself to feel better about yourself and begin to puff up yourself about your own good works and your own standing. And you've allowed the truth of yourself, a sinner saved by grace, to somehow fade into the background. Maybe as a believer you need to rededicate your life. Our prayer is that as we have engaged in this passage of Scripture here this morning, that God has used it to bring you closer to Him. Hopefully you heard God calling out to you, asking you to consider all that He's done for you so that you can be a part of His family. We understand through the separation that is required because of the coronavirus that that makes things a, a little bit different here this morning. But I want you to know that if God has placed something upon your heart, if you need to talk to someone, if there's a decision that you need to make here today, I'm just a phone call away, and so is Charles, so is Kevin. So if God is speaking to your heart and there's something that you need to talk about, give me a call, or Charles or Kevin. We're here to serve you and your spiritual needs. Won't you do that? We pray that you will. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you again real soon.